Welcome to a special episode of the Self in Society podcast. Today, our guest is the incomparable Robin Hansen, economist at George Mason University and a widely regarded original and iconoclastic thinker. It strikes me that in these strange and uncertain times is the perfect time for some out of the box thinking. So welcome to the show, Professor Hansen. Thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, thank you. So as you may know, that sort of description sounds like praise, but in many people's eyes, uh, it's a big warning flag. Hey, that's what I'm, that's what I'm all about, you know. Now, so the main topic on the table today is your idea of variolation. And this strikes some people as just crazy. It's like COVID-19 seems like a horrible thing. So why would somebody intentionally want to get it? Which is what we're talking about. We're talking about intentionally getting the disease, but in a controlled and therefore a relatively safe way. So I guess just give us a bit, you know, what, what's the, nut, the elevator pitch for what you're, what you're talking about here? So first, it's not just my idea. There are many other people out there who have uh, thought and, and worked on this. I am more of an economist than a medical expert, but uh, in history, uh, for example, with smallpox, uh, before we had what we call vaccines now, we had variolation. And in fact, it was the way that George Washington saved the American troops at Valley Forge to allow us to win the Revolutionary War. Uh, he, it was actually illegal at the time, and he violated the law in defiance of the law uh, to in inoculate his troops with variolation. So the idea is that when you get infected, there are multiple ways of getting infected, and it matters. So uh, three big differences are you can have a different dose that is, you can get a small contact where you just get a little bit of the virus, or you can get a big one by, say, kissing someone who's infected. Uh, secondly, it can go through different routes. It can go through the skin. It could go through the lungs. It could go through the intestines uh, by swallowing something. That makes a difference in uh, the disease. And third, there might be different strains out there in the pool of population, different versions of the disease that have different uh, severity of disease, i.e., that hurts you more. So. The idea would be that with a controlled infection, we get to choose. Uh, choose the dose, choose the delivery vector, i.e. skin, uh, lungs, etc., and we get to choose the strain. And we get to choose the moment. So uh, usually when we isolate people, we're trying to isolate people who are infected, but we don't know who's infected, so we have to isolate everybody, or everybody we think might be infected. But when you deliberately infect someone, you can immediately isolate them and much more directly control the expanse, expansion of the pandemic by uh, isolating them at that moment. So deliberately infecting doesn't mean the same as just letting it go wild, letting some population, like people say, let the young people go and party and infect each other because, hey, they have a lower risk of it. Yes, but you also accelerate the disease that way. So deliberate infection would be the idea of purposely choosing who you infect and then immediately isolating them so they don't infect others so that you can control when other people get infected too. Well, the more I think about this, the more it seems sensible to me, and especially given the political context. So I'm just going to take a minute to review where we're at. So people like Paul Romer, who has deep Colorado ties for people who know who he is and his father is, our former governor, his idea is to, and the idea of many other people, is to mass test our way out of the problem. So he has a recent article in The Atlantic with a fellow named Ezekiel Emanuel and saying we need anywhere from nationally half a million to 30 million tests per day. Now, the big problem is those tests don't seem to exist. So just yesterday, our governor of Colorado, Jared Polis, he had a media conference and he said explicitly, we don't have the tests. We don't expect to get the tests. We're not going to use testing to get ourselves out of this problem. And even if we had the tests, we don't have the ability to trace and isolate people. So he's basically backing off explicitly from the t mass test plan of taking care of this disease. So our strategy instead, for people who don't know, is we plan a, a, a partial reopening on April 27th, which in his words, we're going to go from, say, 70 to 75 percent of social distancing down to his target is 60 to 65 percent social distancing. That's still a lot right. So we are reopening in a way, but this is hardly binary. We're reopening a little bit. And he says explicitly, this is the indefinite future. Like this is what it looks like until we get a vaccine. And so that's where we're at right now. And this does not seem like the best option to me. And so, so we're in this really historically unusual situation. So it's worth, you know, putting people's minds back, say even to January. Uh, in most new pandemics, 
the high priority is to lock it down initially, use that test and trace mechanism vic viciously and vigorously to prevent it from spreading everywhere to keep everybody from getting it. That has long been the best and typically successful way to deal with pandemics, was just to very aggressively stop it at the beginning. Uh, typically in the past, there was nothing else other than stop it at the beginning or it goes everywhere. There wasn't a middle ground in the past. Now we are suddenly deciding that because we failed at the beginning and we are not gonna tolerate failure, we are going to heroically do much more than anyone ever did in the past pandemic by having vastly more testing and vastly more tracing and vastly more isolation for longer than has ever been tried. And of course, you know, people like the countries like South, South Korea and Taiwan do seem to have done this relatively successfully. But now we're, we're number one. Our disease, is, our disease spread is, our, we have pretty widespread disease spread, though that's, it's still uncertain what percent of the population actually has this. So arguably that ship has sailed, and even if it hasn't sailed, I'm just realistically not seeing the testing come online. So that could be a discussion, hopefully, that people will be having for a long time is, why do the United States have such a massive catastrophic failure in building our testing capacity? But, but let's well, more presently in, in our moment is, when are we willing to give up hope? Because you know, part of, even in a war, what happens, right? At the beginning of World War II or World War I, everybody says, okay, we're gonna try to do this. Yes, we know it's difficult and risky, but we're all behind it, we're all together, and we're all gonna hope, and we're all gonna like suppress people who are too negative because we need to have hope and we need to get together. And then of course in war, sometimes like you start to be losing, and the question is, when do you admit that you're losing the war and maybe you should quit or you know, sue for peace? And often it's really hard to get people to like quit and, and to admit that things aren't going well because you want to redouble your efforts and recommit and show how dedicated you are to the cause. And so that's a problem here because like we, it's not crazy to think that we could possibly succeed at what we're trying to do, but it's not easy either. Not at all obvious we'll succeed. So the way I've tried to pose this looks, look, we need a plan B. Plan A is this heroic, crazy thing you're all trying to do by suppressing it with enough isolation and testing and, and uh, tracing and uh, hoping this vaccine comes soon. And that's all great, but what if we don't succeed? Can we have a way to track and trace how well we're doing and our ability to switch to something else that will not be as good, but not be as bad as just letting this go everywhere naturally? Well, we're all hoping, of course, for a vaccine. But first of all, that could be a year and a half plus out, four years, five years out. It may or never happen. Happen. There are right. things which don't have vaccines. Which is a possibility. So there, there's going to be one of two. Out we know there's going to be one of two outcomes here. Either we're going to keep the disease contained to a small fraction of the population, or we're going to reach herd immunity. Now, our governor is explicitly talking about the possibility of herd immunity. So this, to me, this, this raises in my mind, if, we're, if I'm going to get it anyway, I would much rather get it on purpose in a controlled way where I know where and when I'm getting it and I have the care that I need to get through it if I happen to develop serious symptoms or even, you know, just to hopefully just deal with isolation. So it seems I to me we're at right. plan B to me. Well, we should be at the point of getting ready for plan B at least, preparing. So this idea of variolation of controlled infection by controlling the dose and the strain and the, the delivery vector is, does need some tests. Uh, uh, I would much rather like do some small scale tests and verify that it works than do just try to get everybody to do it. Uh, but those small scale tests have so far not been done and there are big obstacles to getting them done because uh, for a lot of different reasons, uh, but one, you know, medical ethics committees are just intolerant for any sort of risk on these things. And um, of course, if you're doing a lower dose, lower harm version, you're still doing something that will have substantial harm sometimes. And there's no really drug companies can own it. <laughs> the idea that you'll just do a variation on the actual virus is not something they can have a patent on necessarily. And so, so the question is who will do this initial test? So is this the right way to think about it? We're looking for two things in this test if we can ever get there. First of all, how do you deliver this in the least dangerous way to develop the antibodies? And then, um, well, I guess that's the main question, right? And then, well, what, then how much are you reducing the death rate? So you've talked about possibly reducing the death rate three to 30 times, which is tremendous. If I could 
if I could have a third of the right. chance of dying from this, no. that seems like no. the obvious way to so go. So those are based on the three other data points I could find from other viruses. <laughs> Uh, the only other data points I could find, maybe some people can find some more, but uh, smallpox long ago had a factor of uh, 10 to 30 reduction in death rates by the smallpox variolation. Uh, measles seems to have at least a measured reduction by a factor of 14 from people who got infected with higher doses versus lower doses. Uh, and SARS had measured factors of three, at least from people who were closer or farther away from someone infected. So both of these cases of measles and SARS, these were just observed variation, the actual degree to which you could reduce it, but could be much more if you carefully study the options and, and uh, find the best options. So uh, these are big effects. Even a factor of three is a big deal if we're talking about just everybody getting it accidentally naturally versus uh, in a controlled way. It's much more, say, than trying to prevent the hospitals from being overloaded so everybody can get a very uh, a ventilator. As you may know, everybody is obsessed with, do we all have enough ventilators? But apparently 85% of people on ventilators die anyway. So the best they can be doing is saving 15%. 15% is just much lower than a factor of three. This factor of three should be pretty tempting. And of course, a factor of 30 even more. So I suppose that those older numbers are subject to the same constraints that our current numbers are subject to, which is we don't actually know the total caseload. And so there could be a lot of biases built in because people might have had it. People might have been variolated who already just had, got it or something like that. And that it would be impossible to know that. So that would be one thing that a, a good controlled test could potentially get a really solid answer on this. Um, and I actually think know. these three previous tatas, we're pretty sure of the number. We're just not sure how representative they are. Mm. Uh, that is, it's a big world. Maybe some people tried it somewhere on other things and it worked so well. We never heard about it. That would be my biggest worry. Not that this factor of three, 14, and you know, 10 to 30 aren't real. Those, they look pretty real in particular cases, in particular times. But how representative are they? That would be the main uncertainty I'd have. Okay. And the, obviously, the other factor here is that COVID-19 is not extremely deadly for younger people. So just to round the numbers in Colorado, we have roughly 450 deaths. Only about 50 of those, I mean, I say only, every death is horrible, right? But relatively speaking, are under the age of 60. So, you know, like, so a small fraction of our deaths, and, and even fewer are under the age of 50. So if we're automatically narrowing the, narrowing the pool to people, say, under 40, and then we're doing it in this controlled environment. It's just, it's hard, it's impossible for me to believe that you're not just dramatically reducing the risks here. And for one thing, those people now, we know they're infected. So they're going in the isolation ward. They're not going out and infecting their grandparents and such. So it just seems like to me like the, the risks to themselves and to other people, we can get a dramatic handle on this and achieve, if we're going to achieve herd immunity, let's achieve it in a, a rapid and efficient way that reduces the death toll and reduces the economic catastrophe. Is that kind of the summary here? So assuming it works, which there's good reason to believe it would, it looks like a great plan B. Now, if you were hoping to just lock this down and prevent many people from getting it, now you're stuck in this trading off of economic and social pain versus lives. And, and that's a hard place for people to think about. They might think, well, every life is precious, and so we can't put all, throw all these people under the bus, even if it's not that big a number, and surely we must just lock down forever in order to save them, uh, if that's possible. Now, you know, there's two questions there. One is, well, is there a trade-off between lives and emotion, you know, economic and social pain? I mean, at some point, isn't it worth losing a few lives so we can all get back to living? But separately from that, there's the question of, is it feasible to lock this down forever or is, are we just delaying the pain? If we're just going to crash the economy for a year and then everybody gets infected anyway, uh, you didn't buy anything, really. You just put it off. Well, let me ask you to put on, one of your critics has been Tyler Cowen, another great economist at George Mason. So since he's not on the call with us, can I ask you for just a few moments to put on your Tyler Cowen hat and Give us, give us your best shot at taking down the case for variolation, which I, you have a great response. People can read this. I'll put this in the links when I put, put right. this up. Responding to Cohen, and I don't know. I think that it's a pretty effective response, but give us, give us the best criticism. Well, so he this. had like eight points, which are actually 11 points, but here's the two I remember, sort of the two top strongest points. He presented this up saying, look, we're in a crisis. We have no resources to spare. There are two kinds of resources. There are medical resources, hospital beds, 
and there are places to isolate people, you know, that we can quarantine. The claim is we have none to spare. Your, uh, you know, procedure, your proposal requires that we use more of those resources. So uh, this just is not allowed or tolerable because, hey, we have nothing to spare. My counter argument is to say variolation, deliberate infection, reduces the need for these resources. Uh, so for example, uh, in terms of isolation, again, we're spending enormous resources isolating people because any one person might have a slight chance of being infected. All of the isolation is all the benefit concentrated on the tiny number of people who are actually infectious who we don't know they're infectious. That's what it's all about, locking those people up. All the rest of us are collateral damage being locked up because we might be one of these infectious people that you don't know who. If you deliberately infect people, then all of a sudden you can be vastly more efficient with the isolation resources. You only have to isolate the people who are actually infected. Now it's a much better way to use any given set of isolation resources to find the isolated people and lock them down. The other resource, medical resources, if say it's a, just a factor of three reduction in symptom severity, well that means a factor of three reduction, not only in deaths, but number of people at the ICU, number of people who need hospital beds. If you deliberately infect one person now, or three people now, say, that's replacing, I'm sorry, you know, one person now is, is uh, that you three people you deliberately infect now take up the same resources as one random person later. Mm -hmm. So by deliberately infecting a person, you're trading one resource use now for saving, freeing up many multiple of that later, because, you know, if we're all going to get, you know, herd immunity anyway, then the same number of people are eventually going to get infected. What we're choosing is when they get infected, how bad it is for them. And we also get to choose whether they're high or low risk. So one of the advantages of deliberate infection is you get to choose the people who are the least risky, the young, the healthy, to deliberately infect them. They add to the herd immunity because they are now out there interacting, but they don't infect people. And, and, they, and just to jump in, those people can also then, if they want, do those high risk jobs like taking care of people in the nursing homes without absolutely. posing an incredible danger to those populations. And so you get to, you know, free people earlier. <laughs> if we're all locked down waiting slowly for us all to get infected eventually because, you know, we can't do it perfectly, not only trash the economy in the meantime, but we're all just waiting around not doing things. As soon as you're deliberately infected, you and you're, you know, dead or cured. <laughs> you are now out there. Now, there are doubts about how long immunity lasts. And there are doubts about how severe this disease is. Some people have said that, well, if the disease is very severe, then you'd be sorry if you got deliberately infected. But the question is, are we comparing deliberate infection to the super success of never getting, you know, preventing most people from getting it? Or are we prevent, comparing it against the scenario where most people get it eventually, but they get it accidentally and there's a long delay? When we make that second comparison, the more severe this disease is, the better it is to get a better infection. So even if immunity only lasts one year and every year everybody's gonna get reinfected again, well, you'd rather get reinfected again every year with a milder version than the more severe version, even in that bad scenario. And the worse it is, the better it is to get a mild infection, right? If if it kills one in a thousand people versus one in a hundred, well, the one in a hundred is a worse disease, but if we cut that by a factor of 10, it's a bigger win to cut it from a fact one in a hundred to one in a thousand than it is from one in a thousand to one in 10,000. So the, the worse it is, the better it is to get a better infection if everybody's going to get it anyway. And another point on the hospital overload point criticism is that we saw that Seattle built one of these big extra hospital wards and then they took it down because they didn't need it. In Denver, there's a headline today, we had a, a convention center converted to a hospital ward. I think the capacity was supposed to be 2,000 beds. We just don't need them, so now it's being degraded to 600 beds. Well, to me, that's 1,400 beds. We could be putting people with variolation in um, pretty easily for what, what does it take? About two weeks to get through the variolation process? So that's a lot of people being variolated over, over a span of months. I mean, we should be open to the possibility that we will eventually will have crisis periods where the resources are limited, but we're, we're not at that peak yet. Uh, so well, as long as you're well be below a peak of overloaded resources, then uh, intentional infection would be a fine time to use the resources you have. 
and you could kind of, you could vary it. Like you could bring people into variola variolation as you had the bed capacity. Then if you were worried about unintentional infections, you could sort of fa tamp that down for a while. So it's, it's the kind of thing where it's not perfect because there's, there's lags in the data, but it seems to me you could work it out to maximize the resources you have instead of literally, I mean, there's doctors being furloughed. There's doctors getting 25% pay cuts. There's doctors facing huge revenue losses because they're not doing anything right now. So, <laughs> seems well, to me so like, it's, it's no it's doubt we should all admit we are paying very large social and economic costs for this lockdown. Now, it's not a you know that doesn't mean the costs aren't worth doing, but it does mean we should think about whether they're worth doing. It's worth evaluating the costs we're paying compared to the benefits we're getting. Right, and it's and it's worth mitigating those costs if we can. I mean, if, if we could not spend any more lives and mitigate the economic damage, it seems like the clear, the clear but, win there. So also consider, say, military, right? In a big pandemic like this, it's exactly when your military is less at full readiness and you should be worried that some enemy might try to take advantage of that. If you could have some subset of your troops uh, deliberately infected and then recovered, uh, then they could be ready to deal with the crisis when somebody else was trying to take advantage of that. Or with medical resources, et cetera. If at a peak of resources, we have this really need for medical uh, you know, workers, but you know, a quarter of them are sick, then that's a big problem. It might be much better if they were sick much earlier before the peak came. And then when there was this peak of need, they were ready to go. So another thing that Cowan says is that people just don't want to do that. But I find that hard to believe because my family is effectively bubbled right now. My wife works at home. I work at home. But even I, in my bubbled state, it's like, that sounds kind of appealing. If, if there was a volunteer study, or, or especially after the study, if it showed that there was effectiveness, I'd be like, yeah, sign me up. So what, what's the barrier? I think the, the problem is that a lot of people don't think your voluntary willingness is enough to let, that they should be al allowed to let you do it. So in our world, medical ethics is in strong control of these sorts of decisions. And it's been this conclusion of the medical ethics world that your willingness to do it is not enough of a reason for them to let you. Uh, they need to decide that they aren't being unethical by allowing you to do it. And that's a reason why a lot of these sorts of trials don't get done because they have decided it's unethical to let you try. That just seems bizarre to me because on the do no harm principle, it just seems like letting people do it on purpose in a controlled way is radically less dangerous than just letting me go out and get it accidentally. But in I their can't mind, control my dose. In their mind, they don't get to compare it to this other thing that you say might happen. They have to compare it to some absolute standard of healthy and, and usual times. And in their mind, it fails the standard of being, uh, you know, the usual times good medicine. So, uh, you know, they haven't switched into a crisis emergency mode for re evaluating these things. Well, that's interesting. I mean, if you, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind shifting a bit into the economics of it. Now, sure. if, you have more to, if you have more details on variolation, I'm happy to discuss those things. But I'm, obviously, I'm also interested in talk about a second Great Depression. I'm interested in talk about 30% unemployment rates. I'm, I'm interested in people dying of suicide and poverty and substance well, abuse so issues. I'm an economist, but the things I would say about this are the sort of things you should all know even if you're not an economist. I'm not a specialist in macroeconomics and depressions and recessions and knowing the details, but the fact is the economy is a complicated machine. That's the main thing you need to know. Like a well-functioning economy, which is what we usually have, has an awful lot of parts that are well-matched to each other, that are all set up and ready to deal with each other. We have supply chains and distribution centers and people, all of that is relatively fragile. <laughs> People are very competitive and they're trying to win just even small margins in various kind of markets. And so they're not well invested in the chance of just really big changes. Now, think about the military. In the military, they pay a lot more for a truck than you do. They pay a lot more for a computer than you do. They pay a lot more from everything you do. The why? Because they need their stuff to work in a very wide range of hard to predict hostile situations. It's a lot more expensive to be generalized and flexible and ready for anything. So most of the stuff we build and buy isn't that flexible. It's optimized and tuned for the usual situations. But now we've thrown this economy into this strange, unusual situation it didn't anticipate. It's going to adapt as best it can, and it's probably best to let it do it adapting you know, as, as freely as it can, but still, it's gonna cost you. <laughs> Uh, you know, most jobs weren't set up to be working from home. 
most distribution channels weren't being set to like to have the work, sick workers not be able to stand the workers not be able to stand close to each other to do the job, say in a meat slaughterhouse. Uh, we are just not well tuned for this sort of circumstance. If necessary, we can and do adapt. And if it's worth paying the cost, then we should pay the cost. But have no doubt, it is expensive. Well, yeah, and it's not just like, oh, I can't, you know, go to the restaurant occasionally. I mean, this is people being able to pay the mortgage, be, being able to buy their groceries. The yeah, really, if, if you if a quarter of the population is unemployed, I mean, come on, guys. Of course, this is a huge effect on the economy. The, the worst times we ever like talked about in past economies had that sort of order of magnitude of disruption. It's and you could look at those historical episodes and see. It took a while. So even just the Great Recession from uh, a decade ago, right? It's a very consistent pattern that in one of these things that the unemployment rate suddenly jumps and then it steadily comes down at a steady linear rate. Remarkably, history is mostly these big disruptions that throw a lot of people out of work and then a steady linear decline. The economy is not capable of suddenly putting them all back to work. It takes a long time to take people who are fired and out of work and slowly reintegrate them back into the economy. And so the longer we can go without a disruption, the, the better the economy looks. But uh, you, you make a big disruption and you know it's going to take a long time to undo. Well, I think that that's an important point for people to realize is at this point, there's no magic bullet. There's no easy fix. There's no going back to normal any time in the near future. So right now we're looking at damage mitigation. How do we reduce the number of people who get serious cases of the disease? How do we reduce the number of people who are dying from the disease? How do we reduce all these other economic and personal costs that we are all now bearing in an extraordinary, extraordinary way, some people much more than others? I mean, you know, some of us are more fortunate than others in terms of keeping our jobs and such. Some people are really having a hard time right now. I mean, ex extraordinary hard time seeing their life's plans getting um, destroyed. And so the longer we go, the worse this will be. So if everybody's out of work for a month, maybe everybody can just go back to their old jobs in a month and the old firms will still be there and they're still living in the same place and, and we can minimize this disruption. But if it lasts a year, the companies won't be there anymore. The people won't be living in the same place anymore. They won't have the same skills. It, you know, a whole year's worth of students won't have gone out and got a job. You know, this pain is increasing the longer we make this go. Well, and that's why the variolation makes sense to me as a mitigation strategy, given the fact that we have failed and continue to fail to do the testing, to test and trace our way out of it, given the fact that herd immunity is being openly discussed by political leaders, it's like plan B, we're, we're on plan B. Plan B is a new plan A, because plan A is like, well, that's way out the window now. And so I just, well, I don't get, I don't get I why there's so, not I'm, more I'm afraid we're in sort of a, you know, one of these, I, I, ideological wars or culture conflicts. There's a lot of people who just, they're not going to admit that they failed yet. They are really determined to keep failing. They want everybody to stay locked down. They want everybody to keep on their masks. They, ever, they want everybody to keep doing because they say, no, 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 you know, this is a moral thing. We, there, there are lives at stake. And when lives are at stake, you must pay all possible costs to save them. And that's a real thing going on at the moment. So it's not gonna be easy to convince people to say, to let that go. I have, the, there's this metaphor of, of the monkey trap that uh, you might not have heard of, but in places in the world, one way to catch a monkey is you take a nut, the sort of nut that this mon monkey really lives, and you put it in a gourd, which is a you know, bulbous thing, a vegetable that's dried out. They can stick their hand into the gourd and put their hand around the nut, and when they pull it out, they, they can no longer get through the neck. Their, their hand is small enough to get through the neck without the nut, but it doesn't come back out. And that's the monkey trap. You, have, you make somebody hold on to the something that they just refuse to let go. And you can, they will pay great costs desperately trying to figure out how to get that thing that they've got their hand on. And I'm afraid that's a problem, that sort of thing we have here. This is kind of like a monkey trap. Once you put your hand on that nut of, we could get through this, we could save ourselves, we could prevent everybody from getting infected, it's gonna be really hard for people to let go. Well, maybe your efforts can start to loosen the grip a, a bit because honestly, I don't, I don't see the other, at this point, I, don't, I just don't see another viable path forward. So it's, it's really hard to, to look at the world and say, what, what do we do now? And I think people are really scrambling to find what that thing is. Um, 
I don't know, to me that summarizes what your position is on variolation. Are you inter interested in doing any, anything like discussing what this means for academia or discussing um, going back to your elephant and signaling book and talking about how, what, that, well, what you're seeing so, in terms of that? Or, or is that so too far afield for your, what you're In the past, when we've had crises, after the crises, people struggle to congeal on a story about the crisis. They want to tell a story about who the heroes were and who the villains were. And that often reaffirms some new institution or some new pattern that happened after the crisis. Like after World War II, we say never again should we, you know, allow, you know, a, a leader like that to get so far and to, 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 you know, give in to them and try to compromise, never let again, right? And after this crisis, there will be a story like that. The question is, what will it be? You can see now in the crisis, you don't really know. There are all people vying for different stories to tell, and they will each be trying afterwards to tell the story about how they were right all along and everybody should listen to them. And uh, that may well influence how we reorganize society in various important ways. People may make a bid for a new, say, department of pandemics that's like the army that's just always there but it has a much bigger budget, or maybe we will decide to have some committee that's much more flexible that can come in and make big changes in a big crisis. Or maybe we'll make some new international treaty where we organize together to deal with these. Who knows? But the point is, a time like this is a potent time where people are looking for the story they're going to tell about who was the winners and losers, who were the heroes and villains, and what was the thing that we did or should have done uh, that would make it all better. And uh, unfortunately, that means people are really vying and struggling and fighting over this story. So they're not necessarily going to go with a solution that might work if it would mean they lose. They, they have to admit that they were the bad guys early on. Once people lock into their position, they may want to stick with it. Well, that's one thing that's been interesting to observe is that this is definitely not tamped down American partisanship. If anything, my friends are more fiercely divided over this and the political response to COVID-19 than they were over Donald Trump. And I mean, we had, I had people, friends, not quite at each other's throats, literally, but almost. And this seems even more viscerally um, emotional, which we can understand. There's a, lot, there's a lot of serious pain going on for a lot of people. But it's just, it's just been really right. interesting to me to observe this and to try to myself step back and try to get myself out of some of these ideological partisan bubbles that we see. But so if really some places like decide to back off on the like comp them, then some things will go wrong there. And some people may tell the story, we could have done it. It could have happened. It could have worked. If only other people had kept the face long enough, but no, those people gave in and then the rest of us were dragged with them, right? That could be one of the stories they tell, even if of course, you know, we backing off from the lockdown was the right thing. Of course, it could be the wrong thing in principle. Uh, but the point is, there's not just doing the right thing here. There's also all the different who wins and who loses, who is the heroes and who's the villains which institutions are celebrated or not. So for example, with variolation, if the medical authorities would embrace it and say, this is our solution that we are presenting and then it worked out, then they could be all the more celebrated. But if they opposed it and some other people have to fight them to make it happen, well, then they could end up losing and looking bad. And people might say, why do we give them so much power? Why do they have all this authority when they screwed up badly here? Right? Those are the kinds of things that can happen. And people anticipate those things. And that's why they are often very sensitive about these things and not necessarily just neutrally trying to say, well, what will work? Let's do it. But, you know, defending their... It's almost as though people aren't always perfectly rational in their thinking and behaviors. And it's a lot about blame. So, uh, as you said, I have this book, The Elephant in the Rain, with my excellent co-author, Kevin Simler. And... Um, a lot of human motivation can be summarized as we want to avoid being blamed <laughs> for things. We do a lot of things not because they work or help, but because we're protecting ourselves from blame. And that's going to be happening here too. Uh, people will say, well, what could I be blamed for? And I don't want to be blamed for something going wrong, even if, you know, I didn't actually cause it. So I'm going to do what seems safe in avoiding blame. And so, you know, when the government, when the government's had a choice between uh, lockdown or not lockdown, many of them said, well, it doesn't matter what actually happens here. If I don't lock down, I'll be blamed. And I got I to gotta do it. You know, it doesn't matter the cost, right? And we might say, well, say we lock down for a year and the economy gets trashed. Who will be blamed? 
And the, the, if the politicians say, look, I just followed the medical experts. They told us to lock down and I was just doing that. And who, who wants to disagree with medical experts? Well, then we will say, well, you know, who we blame, right? And sometimes we're, we don't want to blame anyone. We'll blame the foreigners, right? So there's always, it's like China did it. China, China should have done more. And, and you know, if they had only done this, et cetera, then. Well, I don't convenient. know who will be blamed, but I just know that's sort of a major dynamic in all these things is people trying to say, I don't want to be blamed. What can I do that looks safe? Okay. Yeah, that's that sounds right to me. That sounds like what I'm observing out there in the world. <sighs> our, our, uh, this is a tangential, but how many colleges are going to go under for, through this? Um, I looked into those, but I'd be surprised. I mean, awful lot of co colleges have a fair bit of money in terms of endowment. I guess it must be the colleges that are right on the borderline. But of course, you know, if we all get back to school in a year, then um, they'll have lost some portion of a year's revenue. But colleges are actually better able to just do electronic classes than hmm. other sorts of businesses are. I, I, it's hard for me to see colleges as the big losers here. Well, I guess the uh, broader question that I'm hinting at is, I mean, how many of the changes that we're seeing are going to make a permanent stamp on the future? In other words, you know, I mean, sure, we're not going back to normal within a year, but what about five years? Assuming there's a vaccine in two years, how close to normal are we in five years? I mean, are we, is the world still going to look radically different economic? I mean, because of so, people's habits? If you just say, we keep doing what we're doing now for five years, and then it goes off, you know, how much springs back? You could do the analysis that way, but that just seems wrong to me because we just can't keep doing what we're doing now for five years. That just doesn't work. That can't happen. So I have to ask, okay, we do what we're doing now for another two months, and then we do something else, and we do that for two years. What's that other thing? I mean, that's the question. It isn't what are we doing now. It's what will we be doing this other thing in the intermediate period between, uh, you know, not full lockdown and final vaccine or something. Right. If it was variolation the same, then we would basically all be getting herd immunity and then it would be over and we'd go back relatively quickly. If it's some long, you know, dance like they talk about where we'll just let people open and then close it back up and open and close. I mean, that's nearly as damaging as, as lockdown. Well, maybe that's the conclusion here is that people are very averse to your to this idea of variolation right now. But maybe in two months or three months, if it looks clearly like we are headed toward the herd immunity response here, unless we have some miracle, just massive expansion of testing, I mean like you know, thousands fold more tests that are happening now, then maybe people will be more open. It, like, it'll increasingly become the only obvious thing. It's like we can ha achieve herd immunity accidentally, or we can achieve herd immunity on purpose. Maybe once that so, becomes so clear to people- One thing to think about here is this will vary geographically, and we'll have to decide how much of a uniform response to have or how much to have a diverse response different areas. So no doubt, even in a few months here, there will be many areas that still haven't had that much happen yet. And there will be other areas where a lot has happened and they seem to be past at least an initial peak. And the key question is, do these places do the same thing? Or do they start to do different things? So at the moment, you see, we initially all did the same thing. As soon as all the governments in the world decided lockdown was the thing, everybody decided to lock down. And we've been locked down together for a while, but we've had quite a lot of variety in the local responses in terms of how bad it's been. You know, Italy and New York and things like that, it's been pretty bad in other places, much less so. So now the question starts to become, do we allow local variation or do we accept local variation? And then on what basis? And now there's the issue of borders, because um, if there's really highly infected places like New York or Italy, and they're near other low infected places, the low infected places can't stay low infected without keeping out the high infected, right? That'll be a big part of the issue. Not just do you lock down the economy or not, but do you close the borders? Well, that and was how one- How well can you close the borders? Right, that was one thing that our governor Polis explicitly discussed yesterday is like, we can't shut down Colorado's borders. And that was part of his rationale for not rel relying on test and trace anyway. He, we're relying on pretty dramatic social distancing continuous because he just, he just admits we can't keep the infected people out of here. So, Well, but if you can't keep them out and other places get really infected, then your lockdown test is not sufficient. 
in your area, right? You're still going to get a lot of people coming in and a lot of infections. Uh, so, you know, you know, if, if the more places that just say, you know, we're, we're getting through this, then the more it'll be hard for other places not to do that in the sense if they're going to try to stay locked down and stay, stay isolated. It's really hard. Like national borders are somewhat harder to keep isolated, but as we know, we've got an awful lot of immigration, even though it's not officially approved, but within the United States, we are not set up very much to lock down state borders from other states. That's just not something we've ever done very much of or ever prepared for. Okay. Um, sorry, I had another question and then I was, <laughs> I find this all, I feel like I'm living in the twilight zone in a way. It's like, it's occurred to me before. Oh yeah, we might face a pandemic sometime, but to be here, it's like, is this, a, is this the right. dream? Am, am I still in the dream here? Or am I going to? Well, it makes you appreciate other people in other crisis times, because again, after every crisis, we tell this story of inevitability. Mm -hmm. And we know what actually happened. We said the people who saw what would eventually happen, everybody should have seen that because look at these clues. And later on, after this, people will say, look at these clues, you should have known. But now we see, look, at the time, it's really hard to tell from the clues what's going to happen. There's a lot of live options. And, well, you know, be more understanding of people in crisis times. <laughs> well, it'll be interesting. I mean, I appreciate you coming out with this. I mean, you don't face the same possibility of pushback as people you know governors or people on their in their medical staff do but still i mean if if you turn out to be wrong that's taken some uh, professional if and people were risk. taking me if people were actually listening a lot and doing things then i would get a lot more pushback I mean, i'm sure the main reason i don't get as much you know flack is because nobody thinks i have any influence nobody thinks no anybody's listening to me but that's and that probably right but there's a chance somebody might listen and then at that point i will get a lot more of the well, I appreciate, but I appreciate the fact that there's room, there's a niche for this, right? Like you feel like you're able to say things like this. And well, I'm a tenured professor, which right? is a pretty unusual safe niche. You know, it's not clear I could say this if I were at a most jobs where you don't have lifetime employment guarantee and your organizations like fear that what you say represents them. Well, and it's like, okay. I'm not 100% convinced that what you're saying is, is the right way to go. It, but it seems convincing enough to me that it needs to be on the table for discussion. So I guess this is making me a lot more sensitive to the importance of having these outlier ideas and taking them, giving them at least some seriousness. Because ultimately, if you're not doing that, you're, you might be locking I And mean, at some point, you're going to have an outlier idea that is extremely important and is the answer. So if you allow room for those, it seems like you're going to be a lot better off in the long run. So for most people's point of view, it's the question of whether to just accept the usual authorities in each area or whether to put a little more pressure on the usual authorities from what they hear from somebody else. Now, usually that's a pretty risky strategy if the usual authorities are there for a reason and they know a lot. If the public like reacts to some you know, contrarian rebel, you know, how does the public know that this contrarian rebel knows anything relative to this authority? So most of the time people are just would rather go with the authority and in a crisis time, they often are more eager to go with the authority. Uh, they feel threatened, they, they wanna be safe, and they wanna hold on to the authority and, and use that as a security blanket. Um, so the question is, it's nice that I can say these things and you can say them too. The question is, wh who's listening? <laughs> and is there a substantial chance of, of authorities you know, responding in some way to accommodate things that people outside their hierarchy and their organization say. And it's just not clear to me that that really ever happens much. Okay. Well, that's kind of depressing. Uh, give us just- I'll keep trying. To wrap up, give, I mean, give us, maybe someday we can discuss your uh, books on signaling and your, your book, your, book, your other book on technological progress or technological change anyway. And when, what other- when robots rule the earth is actually. <laughs> what other things have you been working on um, both before the crisis hit and then how have you shifted um, your your professional work in the midst of the crisis. Well, like like many intellectuals, I got distracted and decided to think about it. And now at the moment, I'm at the point I was saying, well, should I go further with the pandemic or should I go back to think about other things? So, for example, you know, the last few days, I thought a bit more about how we could reform law uh, and use lawsuits more to deal with many things, including pandemics, because hmm. uh, in a sense. A pandemic is literally a way that one person hurts another, like an automobile accident. You infect somebody. So the question is, can the mechanisms of law by which you, if somebody hurts you, you sue them, 
to what extent could you use those mechanisms to deal with pandemics? And it's not as crazy as you might think that we could do something like that. But anyway. Hmm. Are you involving in that uh, ideas that there might need to, need to be some liability relief, say for people who create emergency supplies? Okay, they don't do this normally. And they're, right. being, they're being excused from some of the normal processes, but we don't want them to be sued out of existence, you know, because they're doing this emergency work. Are you, is that part of your work or is that a little separate? I'm not focused on that, but that's a perfectly valid point. So, I mean, that's more about being able to sign away liability or to, to agree to, to waive liability. So part of the problem today with liability laws is many kinds of liability can't be waived. Uh, the courts won't allow that. And that means you can't say in a crisis, you know, fine, I, I will waive some liability if you will get some stuff to me fast and I will take bigger risks. We're not letting people take bigger risks. And which Ob is Obviously, people, those of us who might sign up for variolation would definitely be signing some uh, pretty heavy but forms. It, but the same sort of legal and other ethical structures that have been set up to prevent variolation trials are also set up to prevent suppliers from waiving their, having their liability waived. We've set up a society which we say there are these ethical rules and they are just always apply. There are no exceptions. And it doesn't matter if you have a crisis or an emergency or a sudden need, we will not allow exceptions to our usual ethical rules. And that's a big obstacle we have in our world today. Is that, is that material going to end up on your website? And give us, give us for everybody who doesn't know, give us the uh, URL and, and wherever else people uh, can find well, you. I have a blog reasons. called overcomingbias.com. Uh, I'm also, of course, on Twitter at Robin Hansen. Um, so relatively easy to find me by searching for my name, Robin Hansen. Okay. So will, I mean, do you, do you expect to write anything about the uh, legal aspect soon or is that like months away? Or uh, no, I've, I've, but I've been writing about uh, just legal innovations rather than just complaining about the current law. <laughs> Okay. I'm much less interested in writing more complaints about the way things are than trying to invent ways to do better. Well, good for you. Bravo. I'm glad you're out there uh, doing this kind of work. Um, I think we'll wrap up at that point. So I Sounds really good. appreciate you coming on the show. I, no, no, I, I thanks a lot. Um, you know, it's obviously a really important time and we need really smart people thinking about possible ways to get ourselves out of that. So, you know, thank, thank you um, for spending some, time, right. some of your efforts on this. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye. Have a good day.